Hello, welcome back. Mike from Canavan Wealth. We've been talking a lot about kind of the brewing cold war between China and Russia and really the West or the United States. And a lot of that centers around the relationship with, I think, mostly China and the United States. And that and ultimately deals with Taiwan. And as I realized that this is kind of the brewing world situation we have, I came to the conclusion that I didn't really know anything about Taiwan. And I guess that probably a lot of people out right there really don't understand what's going on with Taiwan. Why does China feel like this is a part of their country? Uh, so I did some investigating to kind of educate myself. And I figured do it as a video because lots of clients and possibly prospects might be interested in the results. So this all kind of dates back to the late 1800s when the Qing dynasty is uh, controlling mainland China. Although at this time they had... Uh, you know, effectively they were living in Taiwan, although there were indigenous peoples that kind of identify themselves as different than mainland China's. But, you know, the people that live in Taiwan now are mostly associated with Chinese people who moved from the mainland and occupied the island of Taiwan. But this first Sino-Japanese war, which is really between China and Japan over things about Korea, ends with Japan occupying Taiwan. It, it kind of become a part of Japan, although, you know, the Chinese still lived there. So, and that persists until the end of World War II, which is going to put this kind of wrinkle, which doesn't necessarily explain everything, but is an interesting kind of fact about it. Now, during World War II, when uh, China kind of becomes involved in the war, we have this signing of agreement. This is this 1943 one, where effectively we agree that when we win the war, Taiwan will go back to China. Right? And that occurs, right? We win the war in 1945, but technically China and Japan don't end their own war until 1952, although I believe all the fighting had stopped. So it's technically not until right here in 1952 that Taiwan is kind of formally recognized as being back under the Chinese control. And why is that important? Well, it's important because of what's been going on back in China. So at the end of the, this kind of first Sino Japanese war, the Qing dynasty falls apart and is replaced by the Republic of China under the KMT party, the Kuomintang, uh, which becomes, they become the Kuomintang. This is the party that effectively is running the Republic of China. But it is important to understand that during this time, this is still an authoritarian regime. China is not a, I think it'd be hard pressed to call it a democracy at this time, right? But there's lots of other factions. The Qing dynasty comes back for a year. There's already disputes between the communists and uh, the Republic of China. And effectively, after World War II, civil war breaks out in China. And ultimately, the ROC loses and retreats back to Taiwan. So they effectively make their seat of government, Taiwan. And the Communist Party under Mao Zedong pretty much takes over all of mainland China and creates the People's Republic of China, the PRC, as we know it today. And then there's this odd wrinkle that when they give Taiwan officially back to China, it's occupied by a different government that is really recognized as the government of China, or at least mainland China, right? And now for years, uh, China and Taiwan dispute you know, who's in charge and continue to fight. Although relationships do cool over this time period and the fighting eventually dies off. So I've got some notes here to make sure we're staying on track. So, you know, after the Sino-Japanese War, we transitioned to this civil war between the ROC and the PRC. And when that all ends, we end with the Republic of China in Taiwan and the People's Republic of China, Communist China as mainland China. Now, Taiwan goes through a period called the Taiwan Miracle with due to some outside investment and just some kind of proper management. The country goes through radical modernization and industrialization, and they really become kind of an economic powerhouse during this time. However, the KMT is in power throughout all of this time, and they maintain martial law uh, largely because they're kind of still technically at war with China. It's complicated. Um, but because of this, and in the coming years, the, you know, it becomes very clear that the PRC rules China as we know it, meaning mainland China. And 
the world effectively recognizes the PRC as the single government of China. And the ROC or Taiwan is actually kicked out of the United Nations in 1971 uh, because they're not the government of China. And that is obviously a major um, event for them. And I don't know if that was the absolute catalyst that starts it, but Taiwan start to under, starts to undergo some revolutions at that time, not ri- like violent revolutions, but they start changing their government. And in the late 80s and 90s, they convert from the kind of authoritarian structure they had before this to a true democracy. Uh, in a pretty amazing way, they effectively rewrite a lot of their government and numerous parties now start to sprout up. They sprout up the KMT, you know, largely is still in the political scene, but other parties come up. And it's, this is when we really see the shift uh, from Taiwan, from viewing itself as, you know, kind of the proper government of China to its own independent place. This is just Taiwan now. And the, the view of Taiwanese people is often kind of credited during this time from shifting from we're just happened to be a part of China that doesn't has a different government to it to we're like, we're our own place now, we're Taiwan. Uh, and now in modern Taiwan, we have lots of different parties that have different views. Some of them view it as that they would like to, you know, kind of eventually reintegrate with China, although they don't want to do that in the near term because of you know, effectively, they know that they would be giving up their own independence for that. But, the, you know, they kind of their stated goal is long term, we would like to get back. And then there are other parties that would like to long term see true independence. Uh, but through this time is where we get this understanding of one China, two systems. So, you know, we these parties are trying to the, the two different groups, mainland China and Taiwan China, are trying to say we're the same China, except we just have two different systems. They don't even want to call them governments, especially mainland China, um, because they dispute each other's effective existence. Now, China has largely given up that they will never take back mainland China, but mainland China very much sees Taiwan as if what we would kind of see Long Island, as if at the end of our civil war, the Confederates retreated to Long Island and we never got them out of there and they just kind of continued to live there. We would kind of still see Long Island as part of America that just happens to be being run by you know, people we don't recognize as the government of America. Well, that's what happened in Taiwan. And then they went through this kind of cultural revolution, this kind of government shift into this very industrialized democracy that is heavily supported by the United States through a mutual defense act that we've told them because this dates back to the cold war when we were worried about the spread of communism. If you ever get invaded, we will defend you because you are not communists. Um, That really gets us to where we are now. And when you hear about the status quo, that's what China is trying is always upset about that if our relationships with Taiwan or the world's relationship with Taiwan moves more towards the idea of recognizing Taiwan as its own country, that is off the table for them, right? The status quo in their book is one country, two systems. That's part of China. They just happen to have an odd government there, which actually isn't all that odd for China you look back at Hong Kong, right? So Hong Kong was owned by the British for like 150 years, gave it back in 1997. And they still kind of maintain a different government in Hong Kong with different rules and regulations. Now, some of that's starting to splinter um, in this kind of one China, two systems situation. So come back here, make sure I covered everything. Yeah, that's really it. So I wish I could tell you what the future of Taiwan and China was going to bring. And I know this isn't very financially related, but is absolutely going to impact macroeconomics over the coming 10, 20, 30 years. And I hope it's been informative. If you like content like this, you know, please like the video. If you like to see more, uh, subscribing will always help. I hope that this has been informative. I will talk to you soon. Thank you.